Firstly, thank you for everybody that is joining us tonight. Uh, we really do appreciate your time. And uh, <clears throat> I've put a little message in the top there. Um, most people tend to be familiar with Zoom and kind of how it works now, but I'll run through it. So I will just introduce our speaker uh, first uh, tonight. And then <clears throat> if you have any questions, if I don't lose my voice first, then if, I have it, if you have any questions, you can either type it into the chat box um, so if you move your cursor, you'll see there's lots of options on the bottom, uh, one of which is chat, a little bubble there. Um, you can send a message to us, and there'll be a couple of points, uh, one halfway through the presentation and one at the end, uh, which will uh, kind of gather those questions together and answer them as best as we can. Uh, alternatively, if you'd like to rather speak your question, um, you can use the little raise hand function, which is just on the bottom of your uh, screen if you move your mouse around. And uh, I'll be able to see those and, uh, and then I'll just invite you to unmute and ask your question uh, personally. So whichever you prefer. Um, you can ask questions anonymously too. So if you want one to go to everybody, great. If you want it just to us, then that's fine too. Um, but uh, I guess without further ado, I'll introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Charles Rodenborough, who is from Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, I have a very, very brief uh, introduction because it we will be here all night probably filling uh, everything for Charlie uh, but a retired business executive as well as a scholar researcher and author uh, Charlie's been in real estate uh, at Burlington Industries uh, in the travel industry um, and a member of the board of directors for the Rockingham County Historical Society um, and the mark which is what the society uh, morphed into in 2012 uh, for 60 years uh, and two terms of that were as president too. Um, Charlie as well has been married, has four children, eight grandchildren and three great grandchildren and, and has done a number of publications that range uh, across subject matter from Governor Alexander Martin uh, biography to uh, stealing Andrew Jackson's head. Uh, 17 books in all since retirement so definitely uh, definitely keeping busy in retirement. Um, and if you want to add anything else to that, Charlie, please let me know if I've missed anything. <laughs> I've missed anything off. That's enough. <laughs> okay. Um, in which case, I will share my screen. And if anyone can't see it or if it doesn't look right, <laughs> do let me know. Um, it should be pretty straightforward. <clears throat> okay. Great. And so Charlie's going to be the one that's going to be presenting tonight. And uh, I will just turn my microphone and camera so you won't see me it won't distract <laughs> from charlie's great uh, narration and uh, like i said just type those questions in and if uh, you have any problems with sound or anything like that just pop that in the chat box as well okay so let me stop my video and uh, take it away charlie <laughs> okay welcome folks uh this is a a second for me in terms of a webinar like this uh, isn't it remarkable now that we can do this in the face of COVID and uh, continue to have programs at Mark that uh, are a little more in depth and, and available to a wider audience. Tonight we're talking about <clears throat> the Saratown Project and immediately in reading that title, I'm sure you've got a number of questions that I hope will be answered in the in the program itself, but I was, also I hope the program will raise a lot of questions in your mind, and you'll pass them on, and we will have plenty of time to uh, to discuss them at uh, at two points in the program. Okay, next one, next slide. There we go. In 1738. William Byrd was a member of the party from Virginia that met with a group from North Carolina to run the dividing line between the two states. It was generally known, but not specifically surveyed inland. And the party as a mixed party was kind of a, a blend of opposites. In Virginia, it was a group of uh, more or less educated people, uh, less so in North Carolina. Also, 
the Virginians tended to be like first families of Virginia. They looked down their noses at most North Carolinians. So <clears throat> there was that kind of background attention to this, this running of the, of the boundary. But in the fall of that year, when they got to the point where they were seeing the mountains in the distance, and winter was coming on, and they thought they were getting close to where the Indians were, and they weren't sure what kind of reception they might have. The North Carolina, <clears throat> excuse me, delegation decided they were going to quit the survey and go home. And William Byrd was incensed by this, and he turned around and, and suggested to them that he would buy some of the land in North Carolina from them that he knew they were going to get as payment for being on this survey. Uh, he knew North Carolina was not going to be able to pay them in, in pounds, so he, they would be paid in, in land, and he negotiated with them for them to sell him 20,000 acres inland on the frontier. Well, next slide. The frontier happened to be just where Rockingham County is. And he, uh, he had a survey. He, he didn't have any kind of survey already existing. He had a surveyor along with the group from Virginia who could, uh, from the standpoint of geometry, could could figure out what 20,000 acres was. But what they did very simply is they had just run the border between the two states. That's the North line. And then he went six miles down on the West and two miles down on the East. And he had his 20,000 acres. So this is the first land in Rockingham County or really on the frontier of North Carolina that was actually sold because they had just created the base point between the two states. Now, later on, he discovered when they had a real survey made that he had missed what he intended to include in that 20,000 acres, and that was the whole of Dan River from the point where it uh, entered into North Carolina from Virginia on the west to the point where it made an exit back into Virginia. And so he negotiated with the state of North Carolina and got 6,000 more acres. And you see that as the almost triangle down at the base. You'll also see that he do where when the when the survey was going on he knew where the Sara Indian town was or the major Sara Indian town was and that shows very clearly on this map that was made at that particular time uh it's it's fascinating that we have this location of the indians and it came to be known as lower sara town and then in stokes county where the Mount Saratown Mountains were named for the Indians, was another location still on Dan River, <clears throat> excuse me, which uh, was called Upper Saratown. And both those sites have been, uh, have, have had archeology span uh, work done at those sites and reports are, are, are out and exist so these are, these are Indian sites that have been heavily um, studied. Uh, next slide. Now, if you look at the map in the center with the arrow, you'll see the location of what we're talking about. This is the colonial coast. It, in red, encircles the area that was British, a British colony. You'll see as you get down to Florida that the red line comes across again, and below that was Spanish Florida and uh, 
all the initial holdings. Below that enter are the Caribbean islands, which were considered other colonies when Englishmen talked about the colonial uh, America, they were talking about the combined mainland and the islands themselves. And in the islands on the very east side of the island, you see the road that goes south there. And at the very top of what are called the Leeward Islands is the island of Antigua. And those two points are the points we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, Antigua as one of the Caribbean islands and Sauratown, the location on the Virginia, North Carolina border, that is uh, the site of our study. Next slide. Now, taking Antigua first, Antigua was known as one of the sugar islands. The big money, money crops for the colonial empire in uh, America were sugar and tobacco and slaves. Uh, because of that, the concentration of economic power was in the Caribbean, but also in the colonies in tobacco. Sugar was a product that was in tremendous demand in Europe. All the, it was, it was fashionable. Everybody had discovered the uses for sugar, cooking, coffee, tea, everything needed sugar. <clears throat> but sugar turned into being a very tough crop to grow. Because of the fields in the islands, they could not use a plow and plow up the land. They had to use hoes and literally dig spots in which to plant the cane. Uh, you, see, you see that here. It was a terribly difficult kind of thing. Next slide. Another part of sugar Another part of sugar was the fact of processing it. They took it to mills like this, windmills, and they processed the cane by squeezing it. And then they took the cane or took the, the squeezed area of the, it was in liquid form at that time, to the boiler house. Next slide. And there, whoop. We missed a slide in there. All right, that's not. Anyway, let me describe it. The boiler house was hot as hell. And the real impact on a human being, on these slaves, was tremendous. It took 1,700 slaves every year to just replenish the slaves that died on Antigua. In other words, each year, 1,700 slaves died and they needed 1,700 slaves to replace them. It, was, it has been estimated that the uh, expected life of a slave on Antigua was only seven years. So you can see the impact on the work that they were doing and the difficult degree of difficulty that was in it. And of course the British were making sugar and the French were making sugar and politically they were enemies and they were fighting wars in Europe all this time over various claims of land but in the colonies they were also in competition over product and the economy. And that was mostly in sugar at this particular time. So <clears throat> sugar had to be transported on ships. The two had Royal navies that were very competitive and all the factors there are carried from the European wars that were going on all during the period. Next slide. 
by the way, that that here here was the one I was talking about. Here's the boiler room. You'll see that the boiler room, the smoke coming up from the heating and boiling of the sugar from its liquid form into sugar that would be uh, it could be sold. Next slide. Now, a sugar plantation kind of looked like this. This is the plantation called Green Hills that belonged to a man, uh, Colonel Samuel Martin. You'll see the plantation house up on the hill. You'll see at the bottom two slave cabins that were dispersed across the plantation. And you'll see on the right-hand side, the two windmills for grinding the cane and the factory in which it was processed in the boiler rooms. So this was a very typical island plantation on Antigua. Now, pause here to say Samuel Martin is a very interesting connection to our story because his, his brother, his stepbrother, was uh, the last governor, uh, the last colonial governor of North Carolina, Josiah Martin, who fled when the Revolutionary War started. So here we have a connection with North Carolina that goes through Antigua back to the English uh, landowners. Next. Now, when the, the Moravians, and this is a story that is local to us anyway in this area, part of the, the tenets of the Moravian church was mission work. Uh, and they were more adventuresome in, in early stages than any other de Protestant denomination. And they would send ministers out from uh, Europe to the islands or to locations in Africa to minister or mission as missionaries. When they got to Antigua and then to some of the other islands that they went to in the Caribbean, they found resistance from the white plantation owners who were all Anglican and didn't want to have anything to do with Moravians. And so the they went to the plantation owners, and they agreed to let them, some of them ag agreed to let them come on and talk to their slaves. Well, the two who really were the uh, most agreeable to that were this same Samuel Martin that I've just shown you a picture of the plant of his plantation, and a man named Francis Farley. And in 1755, going back some again, uh, William Byrd's son, who had inherited that 26,000 acres back in Rockingham County, sold it finally. He peddled it for, for years trying to get money so that he could gamble. But when he, he finally sold it to Francis, Far Francis and Simon Farley of Antigua. And it so happens that Francis Farley, who was the survivor of the two, two brothers, uh, was very agreeable to letting the Moravians come on. And he was the first one to actually have successful conversion of slaves who, who became baptized members of the Moravian church. So they had been, Africans had been brought over in this trade from Africa to work the sugar plantations, and now they had become baptized Moravians. You'll see in this picture the baptismal fount there behind, to the right, and the laying on of the hands uh, of baptism. Next slide. Here you see later in the process, this is the, this is the whole process when the slaves having been baptized now are raised up as brothers and sisters and are members of the Moravian church. Now remember that because there's a real story to that in connection with Rockingham County. Next slide. Let's 
let me orient reorient you further so that you you know exactly what we're talking about in this map which is an 1809 map you'll see on the left hand side you'll see the area that was wachovia and right in the middle of wachovia is salem so here is what is Winston-Salem, Thabra, and Bethania up above it. Rockingham County is on the right side. You'll see the Dan River coming through Rockingham County from east, well, actually coming from west to east, flowing out of Virginia into North Carolina and then back into to Virginia. You'll see right in the middle of the county or very near the middle of the county, Saratown, and that's the Indian town that we're talking about in this 26,000 acres that Bird had sold to Farley. You'll see in the middle of the county, you'll see Rockingham Wentworth. And uh, the, that, of course, was the county seat later when Rockingham County was, was founded. <clears throat> Next slide. Well, then the mainland colonies, the big product was not sugar uh, because the soil was much better and tobacco was the money crop. This old print shows more some of the processes as they were in the uh, 18th century for processing tobacco. I won't go into the details, but you do see there the, the uh, fires to treat the tobacco, the tobacco storage area, drying area, and then the processing area at the bottom. So what was happening was Francis Farley, who had these plantations in Antigua, realized that tobacco, that, that sugar was in such com competition between the British and the French, and the French seemed to be winning, that he decided he wanted to diversify. And so he, that's the reason he bought this 26,000 acres with the dream and the idea that he would turn it into a Tidewater Virginia style tobacco plantation. Next. Now, there we have example of a typical slave quarters for a Virginia plantation. And this is what we're transferring into from the separate slave houses around the island, because there was no worry on, set on an island in the Caribbean that slaves were going to run away. They could only get so far. They were an island. But when you brought slaves to a mainland location where they could run away very easily, that is physically, they could run away very easily, then the idea of having them in quarters where they could be watched and in mild ways guarded uh, by overseers, the plantation would, the tobacco plant, plantation slave quarters would look like this as opposed to those in Antigua. Next slide. Now the story begins to come together again. William Byrd was William Byrd II. He was an, in some ways a Renaissance man, at least he wanted to be a Renaissance man, and he was very learned. He had been raised actually in England, uh, although his father already owned great plantations in the uh, colony of Virginia. But he had come to Virginia to take over his inheritance. It, as soon as he came, he announced he was going to go back as soon as he could. Well, he never went back. His whole life was lived out in Virginia. He was a scholar and writer, had a fantastic library. 
he is the closest thing at this early period of time we've got in the colonies to a really creative man, a man of ideas. His son, William Byrd III, was a rascal in many ways, but he was smart and sharp like his father, and he rose to be a major general in the British Army. He was not very successful, however, when the Revolutionary War came along because he, he volunteered first for, to command the British Army in America, and they turned him down, so he turned around and volunteered to be the commander of the American Army <clears throat> before George Washington, and they turned him down again. He was humiliated in both cases and was a heavy drinker and a heavy gambler. He had a number, he had two wives and he had a number of children. Elizabeth Hill Bird, one of his daughters, married James Park Farley, the only son of Francis Farley. They were married in Virginia when Far, young Farley had been sent there to go to William and Mary to be educated, but he had really been sent there with the hope that he'd marry a rich young lady, and he did. And the marriage was satisfying to both ends of the family, but they were together, they were, they were bringing this whole story back, <clears throat> back together. They had four daughters, but James Park Farley uh, he died the first year of the revolution. And his fourth daughter was born actually after he died. His wife then went on to marry a kind of a reprobate minister, John Dunbar, who was an Episcopal priest supposedly, and a very rich Henry Skipwith and their lesser personalities in this story as we go on. Elizabeth is kind of the key or the pivot person in this connection of the plantation owners through both the Caribbean and Virginia. Next slide. Now, Francis Farley, the father in Antigua, Though he had been to America and he'd been out to the Sara town and had seen the land and he had kept it, he hadn't tried to sell it. He hadn't tried to break it up over the years. He had kept it for a purpose and his purpose apparently was to make his son, James Park, a plantation owner in North Carolina. Well, that was fine, except when James Park Farley married Elizabeth Byrd, and Francis said, I'm going to let you go out to my plantation to create this tobacco plantation in North Carolina. Elizabeth Byrd was horrified. The idea of leaving when, uh, Wil Williamsburg and leaving Westover and going to the American front, uh, the frontier area of North Carolina of all places was just not in her plans for marriage. So in order to entice her to go there, he planned and was a building in on the plantation, a fantastically beautiful site, a Virginia plantation house. Now there were plantation houses built all along the Dan in North Carolina, and we've got a lot of them in Rockingham or had a lot in Rockingham County. But this was the masterpiece. This was to be competitive with Westover and all the great homes of the Tidewater. And she agreed to go out. And in 1773, they began building uh, Bellevue, their home on the Dan, on a hill overlooking the river and the great stretch of bottomland and today it's right across from the area of the Duke Power substation uh, where they had the uh, tragedy with the uh, loss of uh, the waste from the 
Duke Power Station into the river. So that kind of orients you with where we're where we are or what we're talking about in terms of location. The house was started in 1773. Next slide. Now, at that time, they didn't have anything. There were no houses there. There was nothing there to go and have the workmen have quarters or the have the a place for them to come from Virginia down to see what was being built in North Carolina. So they built what is called a pedetaire, a French word that means a foothold building, kind of the first building, not to be the, the final building, but just a foothold at a location. This is now today still in existence. Cy Rothrock some years ago uh, did the work on restoration of this building and it still exists. And having been built in 1772 in the style of a Williamsburg building, it is the oldest building only in, uh, in Rockingham County. The interior you'll see is very simple. It's very small but this was their foothold as they began to build Bellevue. Go back one slide. The other building that exists there is the one that you see in the screen. It's a brick building and it was believed that it was probably a wing of some sort of the original Bellevue, which is long gone. Go ahead now, jump over, go forward. Next slide. This is a plantation home on the uh, James outside of Williamsburg, back up one. And it is Brandon. It was built in 1776. Now I said Bellevue was being built in rocking in, in on the Dan in 1773. Brandon was being built in 1776 by the a sister and her husband, uh, a sister of Elizabeth Bird. So these two sisters, look, look at this building, the way it's set up with the central portion and the two wings going out. This is actually the face of the, of the plantation that faced the river up there. And on the other side was the land facing uh, approach to the plantation. If you look at that, and then this next slide is a, an earlier picture of Brandon. Go ahead, next slide. And you'll see it in a little bit more detail. On the right, you see one of the wings. On the left, the wing is a little bit out of the picture, but this is the kind of building they, that the sister was building at Brandon. And we think that this may be almost exactly the layout of the Bellevue house that Elizabeth Hill Bird was building on the Dan River. If you look at this very poor slide, next one, uh, you'll see we have dropped that picture of Brandon right in between on the left, the brick house that still exists at Sorry Town and the Petitaire little house on the right. And you'll see how much the site and the description fits this particular location. So this is, a, this is theoretical, it isn't proven. Uh, we have had, next slide. This is the house today, the brick house. It has also been restored by Cy and uh, is used by the present owners as kind of a rural retreat, if you will. So this is a picture in 2012. But you can see it, it has, when you think about it in line of the other picture, you see this could very easily have been the wing extension of what was the Bellevue house. Now they were building Bellevue just as the Revolutionary War was approaching. 
just as uh, William Byrd III was offering to the British and then to the Americans his vast knowledge as a major general to command one army or the other and was being turned down. And as they were building in 1773, the house at on the Dan River, William Byrd III, so despondent as the new year came around, took out his pistol and shot himself. Well, his daughter was horrified. She was stuck on the North Carolina frontier on Dan River, and she packed up her husband and her three children, and she was pregnant with the fourth and back she went to Williamsburg. Within eight months, James Park Farley, her husband, had died. And the baby was then born, so he left four daughters as the heirs to the Sara town. The, the father, the grandfather, Francis Farley, of the girls, was still alive at that time, but he died within six more months. So at that point, the whole 26,000 acres was tied up in the fact that it was owned by four daughters, all very small. And law said that they could not divide the plantation up in that kind of ownership until the youngest was 21 years old. So for a period as the Revolutionary War begins, the Sara town, 26,000 acres, is just laying there relatively dormant in terms of ownership. That's as far as the white family, the plantation owners are concerned. Next slide. Now, in 1980, we did the uh, Rockingham Community College through uh, set up a, an archaeology dig, and a number of people who were in a course that Lindley Butler was running at the college at that time, participated in this dig. And this is a this is a schematic plan of what was found in the various trenches that were open to try to see if there was a foundation under the house, under what we thought would have been the house. You'll see on the left is the brick house that is still there today, the two-story brick house, and on the right is our little pet -a -terre. And the digging in between shows, in fact, yes, the foundation is there. The house can be, as far as archaeology concern, is concerned, could be developed as a wonderful archaeological site of national importance. That's for the future of Mark. Next slide. So at, the, at this point, let's, let's take a, can we take a 10 minute break, Matthew, and just uh, let us get stretch a little? <laughs> sure, absolutely. Let me have a quick look on, uh, if you want, the chance to answer some of the questions, perhaps. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Through. Yeah, yeah. Let's well, this this right. One. Right. Um. So, uh, someone has asked. Crystal uh, Cavalier has asked. Um, are the birds of Rockingham related to the birds of uh, the birds of Rockingham? So, are there? Is that Rockingham the place or uh, Rockingham County? Well. Um, <laughs> the birds, the birds were uh, centered in in this country at Westover, which is in Virginia, on the James, between Richmond and Williamsburg. Is there is Westover, and it's a beautiful, beautifully restored home today, one of the largest and finest in all of Virginia. The birds who came to, or of course, William Byrd II came to Rockingham in running the line uh, between the two states. But then his granddaughter was the one who actually came to Rockingham County to build Bellevue with her, her uh, husband, 
James Park Farley. Great, thank you. And I noticed uh, Mary Barrett has her hand raised. If that's still the case, um, I'll uh, invite you to unmute and ask your question, Mary. Where is where is Bellevue? Is it near any near Eden or near the Dan River in Eden? Yes, Mary. How are you? Hey, Charlie. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, it is. It is on the Dan River, just south of Eden. Uh, there is a highway marker out on the uh, Eden yep. Regional Road. Yeah. That says Star Town, and you can drive down near it, but it is a, a gated area now. The owners, uh, as I say, keep it as a retreat, and uh, the public can't freely go on it. Uh, it is open, has been open over various times uh, in the last 10 years or so, and I would hope that it would be one of the projects that Mark would do in the future to have it open again to the public for some viewing of the site. If you can imagine it as a natural site, I showed you the picture of the plantation in Antigua up on the hill. Mm -hmm. This plantation at Bellevue is up on the hill above, uh, the, above the Dan River right. and then looks down to the all the bottomland mm -hmm. all along there. And in the bottomland was the site of the Saratan Indian town. Mm -hmm. And the hill itself was uh, terraced all the way down at one time as wow. part of Saratan. So it's, it's a magnificent site. And uh, someday, I may not be around for it, but mm -hmm. someday I hope that it's a project for the future of uh, Mark. Is it the Glen Farm area? Yes. Uh, okay. Right. Yeah, I know where you're talking Glen about. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mary. Um, I think that's all I can see. I did, I think there was one question earlier about uh, where the recording for this um, uh, program will be, and uh, that is being recorded. Uh, and that will be available on our Mark's YouTube channel. Uh, so we upload all of our virtual programs uh, onto there. So you'll be able to see that. And we usually uh, link that on our website and on our Facebook page as well. So people can find that. Um, let me just minimize this. Uh, Matt Bowen asked, will we be touching on uh, Native American history of the area? Um, Matt has a plethora of artifacts in the area. Um, I'm your grandson, Drew's best friend. We've met several times over the years. I love oh. you. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was the question, Matthew? I didn't hear the question. Oh, you there. froze a bit there. I think I did too. Sorry, Charlie. Yeah, um, whether it will be touching on Native American history of the area. Well, the, a lot of work has been done on the Native American history of the area because of these two Indian sites, Upper and Lower Saratown. Uh, at the University of North Carolina, there is uh, these objects that they found at the site at the time they did the archaeological dig are filed and, uh, and archived. Uh, we have the opportunity, uh, which was uh, I acquired in discussions with them down there to make copies of all the material and the studies that they did at that time. And this was in the 1940s and 50s. And we could have them at Mark. So uh, again, here's another Mark project for the future. Uh, these records are, have been recorded, have been archived. They are at the University of North Carolina and we could add them to our archives or copies of them. And I'm sure have exhibits in the future 
uh, where these are on loan from the university. Great, thank you, Charlie. And um, actually, Crystal's uh, question about the birds uh, being related just clarified uh, are the, uh, the birds that she was asking, uh, are they related to the birds of Caswell County by any chance? No, they're not, as far as I know now. I'm, I'm, and and uh, I'm not an expert on the deed, some of it, but I don't think there is any connection um, that I know of with the Caswell County birds. Okay. That's all the questions that I've got so far. Keep them coming, but uh, I guess I'll hand it back over to yourself, Charlie, if you... Uh, Okay. And carry on. Just let me know if you want to. All right. Well, let's, if you're ready, we'll just go on. All right. <clears throat> Back up a little here. We're. There. Okay. Now we're going to, in the same project, the Sara Town project or under the category, uh, we're going to start talking about the other story that comes to us that is extremely important and that is represented at the Saratown site and in Antigua. And, and actually, we can extend this story right on up to Canada. But it is the slaves at the Saratown. Now, next page. Slaves were picked up in Africa and were put into what were called COFLs, C-O-F-F-L-E-S. Uh, COFLs in whatever area they were captured in. And they were marched in this way. And this, this is the way slaves were often transported uh, for years in the colonies and in, in Africa and on the Caribbean islands. Sometimes they were chained with their, uh, between their hands, either behind their back or, anyway, they, this is how they kept them in line as they transferred from capture to wherever the location was. Next slide. <clears throat> Okay. Now this here, we're going back in our story a little bit to, uh, I hope, hope excites you with so, some new information and, uh, well, gave you a story that I'll, I think will excite you. Let me leave it at that. In 2012, I was at the State Archives of Virginia in Richmond and a fellow named Bob Carter was along with me. And I had come across a notation in a book that referenced an obscure record of 1809 that was a U.S. Circuit Court case. It's called Dinwiddie and Crawford versus Farley and others at all. Uh, that, that had intrigued me the minute I saw it. I knew that, uh, gosh, uh, there must be some facts in there about the Sara town, and I'd love to see that. So in our trip, we made a couple up to the archives, and in this trip, we tried to get the circuit court case. Well, the archivist who we were talking to said, we can't find it. And I was really frustrated and I said, well, I know it's here. And so we did other research. He went off looking again and sure enough, he brought back a very large uh, archival box. Uh, it was the size of it, almost the size of a table. And <clears throat> he put it before us and I opened it up and one of the first things on the top of the material that was in this archival box 
was this. Next slide. You can imagine my surprise. Here is a list of the Negroes at the land of Eden, 1773. What I had found was a list of the original Negro, the original slaves that Farley had brought to what was Bird's Land of Eden and what Farley called the Sorry Town. So these are the original by names, individual names of the slaves who were first brought to build Bellevue and to create this tobacco plantation. They were all sugar slaves, as they were called sugar slaves because that was the work they did. They knew how to make sugar and they were coming from making sugar to being charged with creating a tobacco, a Virginia style tobacco plantation. Now, tobacco was a lot easier pro product to grow. And I mean, easier in many ways. Uh, those of you who ever worked tobacco know that we never thought it was an easy kind of thing to do. But at that time, compared with sugar, it was a much easier kind of thing. And the idea of life expectancy being just seven years, that didn't apply once they brought these Negroes to these slaves to, uh, to the Sorry Town. But look at this slave list and you'll see down on the first column, you'll see an Ardu, A-R-D-U, below that Polydor. On the next column, you'll see Cudjo. Uh, these are all slave names from Africa. These are these are, are slaves who have been so recently brought from Africa that they still are using or they still are referring to them by their slave names. The next part of the list, the second half down the page, next slide, is headed at make. Maycox. Maycox was the Farley plantation on the James River immediately across from Rich Richmond. And that, that was the staging area. So Farley was bringing up to 100 slaves from his plantation in, the, in Antigua to his land in the colonies on Dan River, but he was bringing them through the Virginia ports and half of them he was staging at his plantation in Maycox. So this combined list by name gives us exactly who the whole crew was of slaves that were brought there to build this Bellevue house for uh, James Park Farley and Elizabeth Hill Bird, and at the same time to create this tobacco plantation. Now, in looking through this list, in the secondary, in the second list, you'll see down there Juba, and um, let's see, a couple of two, two Jubas actually, and another Cudjo. You also see some other interesting name, Wheelwright. Uh, obviously, this was he was given a name that matched his craft. You'll see a Daniel Fiddler. Now, just remember that we'll get back to that in a in a minute. You'll see words like Lancaster and Marlborough. You can see the connection with England and the connection that of creating names for slaves because they ran out of all they could think of, they had to create a lot of them. And here you find interesting uses of names in this list. But next slide. Then in the same box were a list every five years of the slaves at the Sara town one after the other. So we know who was where, when, for a period of almost 30 years, 
actually prior to and just after the Revolutionary War. Now that's what makes this an amazing discovery because in no circumstance that I know of do we have a location where a record like this gives you the story of the slaves and a glimpse into the life that they lived on the plantations in Virginia and North Carolina. Next slide. Things like this little on the left is a clipping out of the Virginia Gazette for January 27, 1790. It's an advertisement for slaves, the sale of Sauratown slaves. <coughs> Me, by Richard, uh, by Reverend John Dunbar. He was the reprobate minister that Elizabeth married after James Park Farley died. Now, <clears throat> this uh, this kind of this was the kind of material that was in this box. All sorts of miscellaneous material, and I'll explain to you why it was all there and why it was such a variety of material. Next slide. Even until the time that the final distribution began to be made of the Saratown plantation, after the four girls, the youngest one got to be 21, and they could begin to, to divide up the Sara town, you see that you've got four lots here. Of These are the chairs that each one of the daughters got. The final slaves that were still at the plantation, along with hogs and horses. The personal property of James Park Farley that had not been divided up because of the ownership rules that were involved at that time. So these progressive lists were all, were an amazing record because put, putting them together, next slide, putting them together, we were able to create slave biographies. Now, true, these are kind of skeletal biographies, but what we have is, first of all, by name, we're able to follow them for almost a 30-year period of who they were and where they were, and other bits of material come from this same archival box. And we were able to structure these biographies and they are housed today at the Mark Museum. And uh, we have them broken down as individual slaves. And we have accumulated the information out of the box and what we know about these slaves and as I say, created biographies that you can go to today and in the notebook there, you can look at each slave and their, their biography. Next slide. <clears throat> Example. One of the first ones in there is Addie. Well, it says here that he she was on the first list in 1772 uh, or 1773 uh, and where she where she was listed from the listing we think or where he was I'm sorry one of the questions is is Addie a male or female but Addie is grouped with Mary Rhoda and Dorcas and Louisa apparently were their children so the thought the belief that Addie is a male. And this Mary was his, uh, Mary Rhoda was his wife. Uh, and then you'll see in the red paragraph below it, what we have as a skeletal biography. You may have been a slave at Maycock whom Dunbar, Reverend Dunbar tried to sell. The question is, is Addie a male or a female? When Den Dunbar could not sell her, sell him in 1790, he brought him back to the Sara town. And they are probably the parents of, we have the wife and the two children's names. So you get 
when I say a skeletal biography, obviously there are a lot of things to to build back in, but you be conceptually you begin to see a person uh, enough so that we could talk about uh, ages and times and guesses of what they look like. So the possibility is there to connect these these people all the way back to their African origins. And it is possible today now for African-American genealogists who are trying to trace their family, if they can get back to this time and connect with their family, they can connect to this material. And presumably over the next 50 years, the capability is going to be there to be able to trace some of these people from the present families all the way back to Africa. And for a researcher uh, in uh, the history of the uh, Atlantic slave trade, this is just a magnificent collection to have. Next slide. Here's a Here's another one, Abraham. <clears throat> Abraham is an interesting character only because he's on the list, but uh, he's, and he's identified with uh, Addy as prime, which means that he was probably in the prime of age. In other words, he was a pr prime field servant, field slave. Uh, and he appears on a number of these different lists and I, in my other research that I have, I have done uh, on the subject, on a mortality schedule in 1860 from Rockingham County, Abraham Ruffin is listed as a black slave who died that year of diseases of the bladder at the age of 100. If we can make the jump in terms of possibility, not probability, but we can make the jump possible, that we're talking about one in the same person. The dates would match up to the information we've gotten in the Arkingham County today. Next slide. Finally, this one always intrigues me. If you remember, in looking at the list, I pointed out two Daniels, a Daniel and a Daniel Fiddler. But what it is saying is Daniel is remarkable because he is a fiddler. Uh, he has a particular talent and craft, if you will. He could perform. And so these two were living at the Asari town uh, and Dunbar took Daniel Fiddler back to Richmond for sale when he sell them and when he was married to Elizabeth Bird. Um, identified as a fiddler was, is, obviously stands out on the list, but a fiddler was a, uh, a, a rather common uh, craft or talent that was very popular and used all through the colonies, but particularly in anything connected with England and Virginia. Uh, <clears throat> our image of him is that he it was a male of about somewhere in the 40, 40 ish time. And uh, he was less a field hand than he was a performer. Now, as a parallel story, Mary Hemings, who was a sister of Sarah, Sally Hemings, famous today because of her connection with Thomas Jefferson. She was the daughter of Betty Hemings and John Wales, Thomas Jefferson's father-in-law. And she, her first child was a son and is recorded as having been a free man of color named Daniel Farley. 
Now, now Fiddler is connected to place and another. And a record of this Daniel Farley in the uh, records of Sally Hemings and her story lived from 1772 to 70 to 1838. And Jefferson kept Daniel as a slave. And when he, in 1775, Jefferson became governor of Virginia, he moved with his mother, Daniel moved with his mother to Williamsburg. And both of these slaves were slaves at Maycox, which was right across the river. They were not free, but Mary, presumably at Monticello, had no apparent opportunity to connect with either of them. We, we don't have that link in there, but we proximity, we do. The use of the Farley name does, however, raise the possibility that there was some connection. And for the, that reason, Daniel Farley remains connected to the unfolding Sartown story. Another future project of Mark. Next slide. So out of this, what, what have we so far gleaned in terms of the research and the study and the record that we've got so far at, at Mark? We now can look and say, you know, I am a man, I am a person. Here is my skeletal biography. I live... I worked on the Sara town. Now you can, you may know me as Polydor, or you may know me as Cudjo or as Lancaster, but you will remember me as a human being. We have literally connected to human life of slaves and their life in the Caribbean and in America at the Sorry Town. Next slide. <clears throat> we have a lot of records and studies, of course, to go to and uh, to work with, uh, showing the importation from 1650 to 1775 from the various areas of Africa where the slaves were coming from. Next slide. We have studies that give us, uh, we have studies that give us facial characteristics of the slaves from these different areas. Next. Okay. So we have some way to kind of flesh out, if you will, these biographies by connecting them and their import into Rockingham County with their origins in Africa. Next slide. We have the connection with the Moravians just west, 50 miles up the river, if you will, west to Salem. And we know that in 1774, Francis Farley Uh, I'm sorry, James Park Farley and James Galloway from Rockingham County made a trip to Salem and their trip was recorded in the Moravian archives uh, for, for that day in, I think it was October of 1774. So they were building Bellevue, all this was going on and Farley and James Galloway made a trip to Salem in order to buy supplies and to see what was the manufacturing capabilities of the Moravians at Salem. And the record in the uh, Moravian record says that Mr. Farley brought a hundred Negroes from his plantation in Antigua. I ran across this record in 1954 uh, at Chapel Hill when I was in, in, in a student at Carolina. Uh, when I saw it, I said, 
boy, there's a story behind that. You know, that that says so much. It connects Antigua and it's a hundred slaves. And gosh, I'd love to know more about it. Well, now at 90, I look back at that that time and what I learned then and what I have learned since. And the story is remarkable to me that unfolds. The connection with uh, Salem has been used by Old Salem and Wake Forest. We did last year a, a consortium kind of thing. Uh, and a book is being published, which will hold a chapter about the slaves at Saratown. And all these things have come, <laughs> come about since I first read in 1954 this item out of the Moravian archives. Next slide. So we, we have that connection up that far. We also recognize that at Saratown is a very large slave cemetery. This is a conception, conceptual picture of a slave funeral during the period of time before the Civil War, when the slaves, of course, had to work all day and a funeral was had at night by candlelight. And those graves still exist. So for an anthropologist, we've got another place on the Sara town for a future study of anthropological study that would connect us with things like the slaves' dietary habits and perhaps those connect with the dietary habits typical of uh, African uh, peoples of the various areas of Africa, which help us to identify uh, who these individuals were and their source uh, or a location in Africa that they came from, uh, the study would give us a whole lot of, perhaps, ideas on the actual life at the Sara town. Next slide. Here's, here's one example uh, of, of a connection. If you can, again, I keep using the word conceptual, so I'm asking you to just kind of expand your thoughts. This is a grave in Africa. You see these grave markers are obviously carvings of what were live trees. You can see also the sweep upward, the idea of upward, whatever that meant to the slave religions of Africa. Next slide. This next slide is a picture of a graveyard or a cemetery in the Caribbean. And you'll see that it is more refined in many ways, but you still see the shapes, the upward sweep, the general upward sweep. And look at this funny one that, look, that makes the curve in here. And finally, next slide. Look at the work of Thomas Day who did work in Rockingham County and particularly around Milton and in Caswell in that area. Uh, and look at the Newell Post in the Paschal House at Milton. And you'll see that kind, same kind of turn and sweep. Go back to the previous slide that you see in this graveyard in, you see the, the shape? of the graveyard in the Caribbean and go back to the previous slide, the next previous slide, and you'll see it carried, no, backward, yeah. And you'll see it carried right back to Africa. This is the kind of progression that we see within the story. In other words, the Saratown story pulls all these possibilities of research together it gives you a framework in which studies can be made by anthropologists, sociologists, archaeologists, historians in general. 
the framework is there through this Saratan idea to really develop many, many stories in the future. Okay, let's go forward then two slides. Here we have a group of professors on the left from the University of North Carolina. Uh, one, two of them are sociologists and one is uh, my friend, Dr. Jackson, uh, Fatima Jackson. And uh, I'll connect with her in a minute, a little bit further. And then our late friend, Lindley Butler in the middle and Cy Rothrock, they're standing in that slave graveyard, which covers this whole area. Next slide. Just beside this slave cemetery is this roadbed. Sai again, Sai is my prop man in all of this. Sai is standing in the middle of the roadbed that goes down to the Dan River and up on that hillside or that bank on the left is the slave cemetery. Now you can see in the depth of this, of this roadbed, the wash from the use over the years, over several hundred years of this roadbed into the Dan River. All these things are still there at that site to be studied in all these various fields. Next. And then finally, in terms of the discoveries of the things connected with this Saratown story, I want to give you uh, a teaser, if you will. In that trip to the Virginia State Archives in 2012 and the box that we found there, uh, were about probably 50 or more documents and they all concerned a Scottish trading company that was filing suit against the estate of Francis Farley, who had died in Antigua in 1775. Next slide. Scots don't forget, and they never give up on a debt. And here you have a situation where the the debts were run up between probably 1770 and 1775. The Revolutionary War came on. The Scottish merchants were cut off from being able to collect their debt. They kept it on their ledger. And in 1809, they were brought suit in the Virginia U.S. Circuit Court called Farley versus Dinwiddie and Crawford. They had to, for that suit, they had to gather together all the documentation that still existed in 189 that went back to 1770. So the context, the content of the box that we were looking at and that we'd found in Virginia was a researcher's gold mine. I, I can't tell you how excited, um, you know, Bob doesn't get, Bob does not get as excited as I do, I guess. But when we found that box and made that discovery, you can imagine my heart leapt. Uh, I'm giving to Matthew in the next couple of weeks for the mark, uh, the paper or the copies of the paperwork that we did uh, at that time, uh, got out of, out of that uh, discovery in the box in, in Richmond. Um, next slide. <clears throat> now this is, this is the paper, this is part of the paperwork just to show you what, and to finish up here. This is a document from Rockingham County, North Carolina with the seal and everything up there. Uh, it is a transfer of the will of Francis Farley in 1775, when he died, 
Actually, he died on a ship going to Guadalupe on his way to the States or to the colonies. And it is a not Rockingham County document, which we don't have in Rockingham County. But, but it was in this box in Virginia uh, under this court case in 1809. And the fascinating thing is that, next slide, at the bottom of this document, we find the signature of Thomas Henderson, clerk of our first clerk of court of Rockingham County. So this document shows that it was written in North Carolina in 1775 because the uh, will of Francis Farley had been sent from Antigua to North Carolina to be put on record in what would be Rockingham County, <clears throat> excuse me, and the document actually belongs here in Rockingham County. It's coming back after, what, 200 years. Uh, it is, this is not, I'm not able to give Mark the original documents, but these are the copies that they're going to uh, have it, Mark. Uh, the point is that this document doesn't exist today in Rockingham County except in this form. It still exists today in Virginia in that archival box that they're holding in the archives up there. And the amazing thing is that if you look in the first book Rockingham County Book A, the deed books, you'll find that pages 40 and through 43 are missing. We've never known over the years what those pages must have been. But in all probability, in order to send this document back to Virginia for the court case in 1809, it had been torn out or taken out of Rockingham County and sent to Virginia and it had been preserved up there all these years. And it is the will of the man in Antigua, the connection all the way through to this story. Uh, these documents will be available for research in the future at Mark. Next slide. So let me conclude with the idea of the, just the idea of the understanding the flow of ancestry. From Mark now, where we have the Saratown project, we also have the connection with doc, through Dr. Fatima Jackson, who heads up the Cobb Research Laboratory at Howard University she and I, for a period of time, worked on these papers together. It is a project that they still hold open, although it, it has been dormant for the last 10 years, but it is still connected with the Cobb Research Laboratory uh, at Howard. The potential for this connection between Mark and Howard University is there for the taking. It is all set up. Folks, I've done as much as I can at 90. There are probably not many things further that I can do on this project, but I hope that it gives Mark a whole set of projects and ideas for the future. So that is my presentation tonight. Do we have any more questions? Okay, I'm back. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Charlie. I just want to say, first of all, and uh, yes, there is probably a, a lifetime of projects and, and <laughs> research avenues for the mark, uh, not just with this, but many of the other projects and uh, uh, articles that you've given us over the years. So uh, thank you. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Um, there were a couple of questions. Let me just bring uh, that up. Uh, Lucas, uh, uh, Bernard or Bernard, I'm not sure how to pronounce the last name, uh, had asked whether the recording might be sent to the participants' emails. 
uh, no, that's just going to head on to our YouTube channel. Um, so uh, I just said before, that's going to be on our, um, the link is going to be on our Facebook page and on our website uh, where you'll be able to see not only this recording, but uh, some of our previous uh, virtual programs as well um, for, for 2021 and, and this year as well. So uh, that's where you'll be able to see that. Um, there was another question on the Q&A. So let me bring that up. Um, da -da -da -da. Bear with, sorry, too many boxes open. Okay. <clears throat> um, Crystal had mentioned that uh, Thomas Day has uh, native ancestry and isn't 100% uh, African lineage. Um, and it uh, also asked uh, whether you know of anyone who's reached out to people of colour in the area, descendants uh, of Thomas Day uh, in the county or outside the county. We have tried with the resources that we have. We've had it in the newsletter. Uh, and I've given these programs or something similar to this at uh, DAR meetings and various meetings around the county. We really do want to have, and I hope that there are a number of African Americans who are watching this tonight, because the opportunity is there to work with this connection both at Mark and with Howard University. Now you don't have to be a, an academic in order to do that, but this material is there. I have given it in at two yearly meetings of the African American Association uh, when it's been held in Greensboro. And we have tried to reach out and there is definitely interest that has come in, but let me say the plug hasn't been plugged in yet. We haven't made a really good solid connection. And I would love to see uh, instead of an old white man doing this story and developing it further to find a young African-American male or female who would, would like to pick it up and would work with it because it, the potential there for African-American genealogy is is humongous. <laughs> Absolutely, and and we've covered genealogy um, quite a lot <laughs> in in Mark's kind of history. And I know that uh, one of the programs in the cards, potentially for the end of this year, is genealogy of uh, African Americans. And and of course, you can't just go on ancestry uh, like many of us can. Um, and so, looking at alternative uh, sources of information, so that will be one. Uh, great source um, and actually the others are funeral homes of the area as well actually uh, ironically but that'll be towards the end of the year but it'll be touching on that subject um, now I know you probably can't see some of the uh, chat uh, questions and, and thanks that have been posed so I'm just going to read a few out to you Charlie I hope I'm not going to embarrass you here but um, <laughs> uh, Mary said thank you uh, Gordon uh, said, very interesting thank you for presenting Charlie um, Matt had also said thank you for all your hard work uh, on the county's history. Um, and when does the book come out? Uh, yeah, and obviously a lot of comments as well about so much research potential with all, with all of this. Um, and uh, I, I know Mary had asked as well, assuming any of these projects uh, taken up in the future would require grants uh, to pursue, uh, yes and no. I think for some of it, yes. For some of it, um, probably enthusiastic volunteers to take up the mantle for some of it. But yes, grants, I'm sure, will be involved further down the line uh, for some of these projects, definitely. Especially for the mark, we are a, a small team. Uh, so we, we would look for uh, funding sources that way. Um, Matthew, have you got any I, other questions? Oh, sorry. Okay. One final plug before our time's out. Uh, Actually, today on my blog, I've got a blog and I'm putting various stories on it about various research things that I've done over the years, things I've written about or subjects I've been interested in. Uh, one that went on today uh, is an extension of one of these particular stories that comes out of the Sara town 
uh, about the sale of slaves. And uh, you can go on to the blog at any time and, and follow me. And, and from time to time, I will have uh, blogs about the Sartan and, and a lot of stories that will interest or involve Mark. Uh, the blog is Charles Rodenbow, my name, lowercase, dot wordpress.com, W-O-R-D-P-R-E-S-S, -S, all of it in lowercase and separated by two dots. Um, yeah, thank you, Charlie. Good plug on that one. Um, <laughs> plenty of material to go on there for sure. Uh, and we'll be kind of piggybacking on a few of those articles and putting them on um, the museum's blog as well. And we'll, of course, put that address on, uh, on, on the Mark's blog. So you can easily find uh, Charlie's uh, more extensive <laughs> blog of, of his articles. Um, I guess one last question we've got uh, from uh, Matt is uh, an interesting area for study would be the Melungeon communities of Rockingham County. Um, and just said that the triracial communities of Rockingham County are large, particularly in uh, Goinstown community as well. So that's another Okay. Good, good, uh, the story and the Melungeons is, is obviously one of the most important stories that Rockingham County connects with. Uh, and it is entirely possible that at some point in time, some of these slaves could connect uh, with the Melungeon story. But just thinking about it, realize that if you had 100 slaves who were brought from Antigua, to the Dan River around 1775. Imagine how many African Americans today have roots in that story. And, you know, that's the future. <laughs> that's the future step. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you, everybody, for your questions. Uh, like I said, the recording will be available uh, on our YouTube channel, and we'll link that from our Facebook and website. Uh, over the next week and um, if you want to reach out um, I will pop my email in quickly because <laughs> uh, it is a rather long one but uh, if you do have any other questions uh, please don't hesitate to email myself uh, I will pass it on to Charlie if I can't uh, answer it <laughs> um, if it's a historical question um, but I've just popped it in for everybody there to see and uh, yeah just please do reach out I will say as well, we are always looking for uh, new ideas for programs as well and for people to take up some of these uh, research opportunities to help us out as well. So if uh, you have any information or know of someone who might be able to help us with some of these uh, areas of research, then yeah, please do get in touch. Um, the museum itself, uh, if you do want to pop by, uh, we are going through a, a HVAC uh, a project, a rather extensive one, so the courthouse itself um, isn't readily open, though we can open that by appointment um, if you reach out to us. But our right tavern, which is the um, 1816 wooden tavern across the road, is open uh, Wednesday through Friday from 10 till 4. Uh, so please do uh, drop in, uh, give us a call. We'd, we'd love to see you. So, um, yeah, thank you very much, Charlie. I appreciate it. Um, and thank you, everybody, for, for attending tonight. And uh, please take care and, uh, and look out for more content from us. Thank you very much. All right. Bye-bye, Charlie. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank Thanks you, everyone. Lot. Thank you.